Uh, you're welcome to uh, today's special HCI at KAIST seminar. Uh, we're delighted to have Professor Sangwon Lee, uh, who is currently an assistant professor in computer science at Virginia Tech. Um, so I've known him for a while and I've uh, been loving his work uh, around real-time collaboration in, in live programming, um, live crowdsourcing kind of settings. Um, but he's been also starting to explore new areas, especially computer mediated empathy, which I think is a really exciting direction. And we'll be excited to hear about that, that new direction that he's been working on. So without a further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Lee. Great, thank you. Can you hear me all fine? Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, thank you, Shuho, for the uh, introduction. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here and then honored to talk about my research work. Um, and this is going to be about liveness and computer media empathy. And then the reason why it has two different things uh, is because I'm in the middle of, uh, you know, in my career, like early career, where I finished up my uh, PhD in 18 in the University of Michigan. And now I'm working as an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. So this is a little bit of messy talk where it talks about both part, a little bit of both part, and then how those are related. Uh, so hopefully that will be. Um, useful for you in some way, um, but I'm not going to be really uh, rehearsed. <laughs> so please bear in mind. So let me talk about the live creative collaboration first. So, um, so I create artifacts and artwork, uh, and I because my background is um, from computer music. So I wanted to start off by saying that uh, as a creator and practitioner. Um, researcher or any 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 anybody who creates artifact, like we always want to better understand users, and this is because our goal uh, is to create an artifact that people need, and eventually we want to provide an engaging user experience. Um, the problem, the challenge is that the creators need to know in advance how the artifact is going to accomplish the goal when they create it, and this is kind of uh, we, like a lot of in a lot of creative practice. There's a similar challenges. For example, there's like food cooking process where like, things are happening in the kitchen and then those are bringing it to the table and then food is the artifact. And then maybe the program that you write could be written in a dark room that has no window, but it is could be used in a completely different context in an outdoor or mobile device. So that like, you know, there's a clear separation between those two um, creation and consumption process. So what do we do? Like in the field of human computer action, researchers have uh, address this problem by involving users in the design or development process. For example, we, uh, we do usability testing and then study how people use an artifact or a program. Or we invite stakeholders to be part of the design process so that uh, they can be part of it. And Or maybe researchers or developers visit the context that the people are in and working um, and try to understand the problem that they face. But still, it is going to be a problem because the turnaround time is really long. And then the other thing is that this is not a, the most pleasant experience, right? Like, you know, if you have done user study, you probably ask people to do something that they're unfamiliar with. And then, like, you know, we almost like torture them in some way, like we try to do anything that is in, uh, intimidating, like ask question and ask them to justify their uh, behavior, which is not happening. So like this is not an engaging uh, user experience for them at least. So the challenge is that, um, yeah, so if we, it, would be, it would be great if we could uh, minimize the delay between user involvement and its effects. Um, and then it would be desirable if people who are involved in the creation process can also have engaging user experiences. So the goal of my research is to make a user involvement uh, engaging and immediate. So I try to find my answer from my personal experiences. And some of you may remember this painting. Uh, more of you will, like if I show you this video. So basically this is the video uh, painter named Bob Ross who painted this painting in front of camera, uh, not in real time, but like, you know, they, they showed the entire whole process. Um, and I personally recall this, uh, watching this show was mesmerizing to witness all the process and the, how the artifact evolved. 
and how effortless it looks, um, which motivates a lot of people to do uh, painting. Um, and I'm almost tempted to say that uh, the, the process of creation is even more compelling than the artifact itself. Um, <clears throat> another example is food in this picture. So let's suppose this is like a food that you got that you get in a high-end uh, expensive restaurant and you may not believe it because it doesn't look too much too different from what you could have ordered at home. Um, but if you see what's happening, you know, people love this kind of food probably because it's cooked in front of you. And then like this chef or a performer in a sense do cool tricks like cracking the uh, egg in the air or something. So, so and you can see that people value this live and performative aspect of the cooking process and the resulting artifact as well. So I see the potential of creating artifacts live in front of people, just like how the chefs cooks in front of the customer or musicians perform live music. And the users can see the whole in entire process and they get the, the watching this experience is part of their user experience of using the artifact. Another interesting uh, possibility is that we can bring users and make them participate in the creation process. So these are the interactive system that I developed on the bottom. Um, and in this scenario, user actually make contribution to the artifact creation. So they get, uh, but also they can get immediate feedback. They can make an immediate request. And then uh, at the end of the day, have, they have sense of ownership on the artifact that they create. So one of the outcomes from my PhD work is that I was able to define the terms live and liveness, which is very subtle in, in engineering standpoint or technology standpoint, but I wanted to give a working definition that I'm trying to use. So live means that a system slash or process is live if the process of creating an artifact is perceptible or visible in near real time to spectators. Liveness is defined as the extent to which the process of creating artifact is immediately and continuously perceptible or visible to spectators. So yeah, there are three different components. Immediacy is one thing, continuity is another thing, both of which are measurable and the perceptibility or you know, how much you can feel is probably relevant to immersion that people talk about in the ARBI um, field. So this is my research. I developed an interactive system that transformed formerly non-live creation into live collaborative creation for user involvement and developing tools and methods that preserve liveness in collaborative creation. So let me give you an example, an extreme example of live collaborative creation. So let's suppose there are two programmers that are developing a graphic user interface for a mobile phone. And what's uh, unusual from uh, this setup is that both of them are working on a single program on a remote mobile device, let's say tablet, in real time. So they're sending code text from their laptops to the device over the network instead of working on their own copy on their laptops. Inter more interestingly, at the same time, there is like a user who is using the software that is being developed. So initially the application will have nothing because they're building the GUI from scratch. And as time goes by, GUI gets more complicated and the user can use the application that changes dynamically. So, you know, please hold on to the question why someone would ever want to do this, um, except that this is an interesting setup where the development and the usage are happening at the same time. And I mean, like if I give you a metaphor, it's like you're playing a piano when someone is building the piano. So in this scenario, there are a lot of challenges, obviously, We're coming from the live collaboration. The first challenge is that program state is not clearly visible to the programmer. Uh, in addition, the underlying program state uh, can be changed by any one of these three people. Um, and on top of that, the two programmers need to be able to freely and rapidly write program without worrying about uh, potential conflicts. For example, they could have a variable name count and then like one person's count could um, interfere with the other person's count, for example. And obviously usability is changing dynamically, which is not ideal. So to address this problem, I made, uh, so this is my, uh, one of the early works from PhD. Um, I made a web-based programming environment in which you can see the state of the program uh, running on a remote device in real time. So you can see the list of variables, function, and any expression that could be evaluated and their values at given time. So you can see as the person moves the things around, you can see the position um, 
updating in real time. So it is kind of like a debugger in a sense, except the fact that the program is continuously running. Um, so with this tool, the programmer can get live view of the program state through this visualization tool. Um, another thing that I developed is that um, the, the shared namespace and then separated individual namespace so that they can uh, improvise in coding without worrying about having conflict. And then when they want to share some state, they can export this to the shared namespace and then the other person can use it. So let me answer the question that I uh, asked you to hold, like why would someone, I'm like, why someone would ever want to do this? So this was actually a, a computer music piece that I did. Um, I think it was 2013, 12. Um, sorry about the experimental music noise, uh, but basically the idea is that, hey, writing a program on the fly, live, so improvisation on the programming could be part of the musical aesthetic. So this was coming from my weird computer music background where um, people do a lot of experimental stuff. Uh, but you can see that uh, that audience, uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but like, you know, the audience was really engaged with this, watching the entire process of um, like creation, uh, not just playing the instrument, but also building the instrument on the fly. And then there's like audience communication and technique that we use uh, by putting stuff like interface that we're building on the projection and chatting messages. So this setup is uh, well exemplified both liveness and live collaborative creation. You can see three components commonly find in live setting, uh, creator, uh, spectator, and artifact that is being created. And liveness here indicates that both creators and spectators have immediate and continuous visibility of the artifact. Um, lastly, the system enables live collaborative creation by having the spectator participate in creative practice. When, uh, the, in which case, artifact is, uh, the, a piece of music is the artifact uh, or and the, the mobile music instrument. Uh, this is another example, um, non-musical example that I uh, can introduce where I uh, create a system where end users can generate like interactive uh, prototype with crowd workers. So here what happens is that a requester speak and draw like sketch what they want on a, a board like, you know, like a um, Google draw kind of application. And then crowd workers will be listening to the um, uh, request, verbal request, and then use these uh, technical demonstrated remix uh, because like crowd workers are not necessarily expert in programming either. So we had to create this uh, technical demo and remix. And at the end of the day, what you get is like a GUI application that interacts with a user. So you can imagine this anime, anime knockout or anime moves and then Mario jumps and so forth. So, and this again has this common uh, components in uh, live collaborative system where um, people can speak and then the requester has, uh, uh, or both groups of users, uh, both the requester and the worker have immediate and continuous visibility on the artifact that, they, that they're created. So this is an example that, uh, that was created by a system called Sketch Express. So this is done in an hour um, and like by saying it to the crowd workers, and crowd workers made this uh, program work uh, within an hour. And I imagine that you have to create this prototype in programming, which is going to take a long time, but this was done within uh, an hour. So you can see that like this animation that is triggered, that is being triggered by the user and then uh, demonstrate how the, the prototype works. And then you can use it to, to communicate with designer and developer in the early stage of the prototyping or the design process. So yeah, why not do everything live then? Um, because it's good, because it's engaging, like let's do everything live. Um, but people will resist because there are challenges involved in live uh, creation or live cre collaborative creation. Um, we can imagine why you wouldn't want to write a paper in front of uh, reviewers or why you wouldn't want to review a paper that is being written live, right? So um, what are the challenges? It has to support rapid and effortless creation. So it has to be within hour or minutes. Uh, it cannot be days and weeks. And it has to look uh, effortless so that it's the, the person, the people who are watching the process could be could feel engaging about it. And then there are some audience communication components involved in it because 
if you just do something on your own and then and then the audience may not know what's uh, what that means. So these chefs performative performative tricks uh, is kind of augmented or even uh, exaggerated to tell the audience what's happening. And then like in, uh, making artifacts visible is if it's physical artifact, it's not too difficult, but if it's a remote digital artifact, it takes uh, efforts to make this artifact visible in real time. Uh, collaboration is more difficult, like obviously audience will not have the domain expertise and there's limited time to organize like because it has to happen within minutes and coordination and communication is challenging. So I have addressed some of those challenges uh, in, in, in a few different topics. So I, I looked at like how to support live participation, how to create technique like technology uh, that could support rapid and effortless creation and so forth. So you have seen two of the work already, like live coding GUI and then uh, Sketch Express, which is the uh, WIST 2017 paper. Um, and then personally, I was coming from computer music background. So like I worked on a lot of new interfaces for musical expression and writing, uh, but, but like I had uh, some application that has um, general, uh, um, that can be applicable to general context. So writing is one thing, programming is another. And then I worked on some of the cross-sourcing work and there are some UI design work. So a lot of the work are from music, but I slowly made transition to live collaborative creation. So that was the first part of this talk. Uh, there are three other parts. Uh, and I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give, uh, introduce one more work on the live creative collaboration. Uh, and then uh, it, uh, talk about how I made transition from liveness to empathy. So um, one of the most well-known example of user involvement or audience participation is like, you know, uh, actually audience participation in the music concert. So you can imagine musicians have a passion to involve the audience in the live performances, such as having them sing, clap, or stump to the music. So this is an example from Queen. Uh, you probably know this piece called We Will Rock You, where the most of music coming from uh, the audience by their famous stump, stump, clap, uh, or clap, clap, stump, or the other way around uh, pattern. Um, yeah, so that's good. That's good for them, but you know, not, uh, not like the problem is that not everyone is queen. Uh, so how would I make um, someone in the audience, like let's say a conference or a lecture hall, how can I make everyone participate and make music? Um, one of the opportunities that I have, I utilize is that the fact that everyone has a smartphone, everyone has a um, good enough device to emulate or simulate a musical instrument. Uh, but that's not enough. Like the, another challenge is that they have to be able to participate immediately. And then like, obviously not everyone how, will have a musical experiences. And the other kind of problem is that how to sustain their participation. So let's say I give you an musical instrument that you can master in five seconds, for example, how would I make them to play the instrument for 10 minutes? So, you know, that's gonna be difficult. So if I give you a triangle and then you know how, what's going on, and then after 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, you will lose interest, which is gonna be a disaster for a musician who wants to play for 10 minutes. And then obviously orchestrating the crowd immediately without rehearsal, without practice, is gonna be difficult. So how do I solve this? So this is the mobile musical instrument that I developed called Crowd and See. So basically it's a very simple, stupid musical instrument. You can move dots, which is, uh, which is uh, good for, uh, specifying the mel melody of the music. And then apparently you don't have to do anything. You just need uh, to change the looped pattern and then it's gonna make sound. So you, you don't have to press keys and so forth. So hopefully um, if anyone can, if someone can write a URL in their smartphone web browser, they will be able to generate this sound. The second challenge, how do I sustain their participation? So apparently you're not, you're not gonna want to um, let's say you're not going to want to like play this instrument for 10 minutes. The, the, another motivation that I give them is like, a, uh, I create this temporary social media, uh, using this instrument. So basically the melody is kind of your social media profile and everyone's up in their profile. And then once you, once you submit your profile, you can see other people's profile too. Um, 
And you can see that JSON created this pattern and then Fox 1298 created this interesting pattern that looks like a star. So, hey, I liked it. I can send a heart button to uh, heart to the other person so that they have another motivation to participate in the, in the piece. Um, and then this was a piece that I created in 2015, I believe, or 16, 15. And back then, like Tinder was a big thing. So I was actually inspired by Tinder and then create something um, close to uh, the social media where you can browse, swipe left and right if you like it uh, or not. And another thing that happens is that you can kind of do real time musical dating or um, like interaction by overlaying your pattern on top of the other person's pattern and then kind of uh, play together. And then if they like each other's uh, pattern, you get this like a delightful sound effect that says it's a match. So that all sound effect becomes a part of the music piece. Again, this is one person's interaction, but that's not enough because I have to orchestrate the crowd to play a music. So what do I do? I go up on a stage, it sounds nerdy. Uh, I go up on a stage with a laptop and then uh, start writing code in JavaScript. And then what I do is I change the configuration of the mobile musical instrument that they're playing in real time. And then I send the cloud uh, code to the cloud service and then they will change the mobile instruments uh, mapping in real time. So let's say I can uh, change E minor to uh, C major, or I can change the timbre from piano to violin, let's say. And then that's, that way I can sort of make like a very uh, simple changes in the music that they're playing, like that they're playing for themselves. Uh, so let's say there are 100 people and then my code will be distributed to 100 mobile phone. And then there's a way that I can distribute the uh, code in different ways. So one part of the, like let's say 50% of the people will play one thing, the other 50% uh, will play the other. So the metaphor here is kind of like, uh, hey, they are strumming the guitar, like the string of the guitar, and I am grabbing the neck of the guitar so that they will play everything in the right scale. So in that way, I can play certain kind of music. Uh, and this is my performance interface that I use. So as you can see the live coding editor on the bottom. And then this is projected on, this, on the performance space so that people can see what's happening and how many hearts that they get and who's leading and so forth. Um, so again, this is not like a popular music. It's a very experimental music piece, which I'm gonna play a little snippet, but hopefully you'll be able to hear what I'm playing. Yeah, so you can see that uh, I can make some changes and play very simple melody. And then the weird thing is that like maybe as a listener is not a component piece, but as a participant, it was component piece because people loved it. They know that they're the one who's creating the music because only sound of the music is coming from their speaker phone or, or speaker of their smartphone. So I presented this work in many different community from computer music to, to HCI, creativity and cognition. And I have involved uh, more than 500 people in total in various places. Um, so we uh, analyze the interaction traits and then, uh, and then look at uh, how it changes over time. And the main takeaway that you should get from this graph is that the bottom two region is more of a musical interaction. Uh, like upper three part is more of a social interaction. So you can see this, social um, uh, interaction is the main drive that help uh, sustain the uh, participation of the audience. And then we plotted each audience member into this musical social uh, uh, 2D plot and then realized that some people are very uh, active in this uh, social uh, interaction while some people were kind of lurkers or loner uh, and then just focus on the melodic uh, parts of it, musical part of it. And then like uh, the, the part that I like about this uh, platform is that uh, the fact that we were able to accommodate a diverse set of approaches uh, in participation. So it's not like I ask everyone to like stand up and then clap, which could be intimidating for some people like who does not have um, a musical background or they, maybe they could be just introverts. Um, but this particular platform was able to 
accommodate a lot of different approaches. So that uh, wraps up my first project called Crowd and Street, uh, which support immediate and sustainable participation. And then I talked about the technique that I used to uh, orchestrate the crowd. So let's move on. Like, so this was kind of like, kind of like a, a one example work from my PhD. So I, at the end of my PhD, I thought, hey, this liveness is somewhat relevant to, uh, uh, I think, called empathy. Um, so I kind of suggested, uh, set my research agenda with these two terms. Uh, because what I did here is uh, live collaborative creation. And then what hap what's happening is that, uh, Basically what's happening is that bridging the gap between this creator group and user group. Uh, <clears throat> and the main uh, technical contribution is coming from the liveness. And then because the artifact is shared uh, in real time immediately and continuously, all the expressivity that we have on the artifact is preserved and conveyed to both groups. But uh, so like we speak on, uh, on to the system or we demonstrate uh, like we demonstrated uh, in the paper prototype and that we use social media in everyday uh, daily life. And then uh, there's a lot of natural expressivity that involves, that is uh, implemented in this system. But can we do further? So I thought uh, these bridging the gap between those two groups could be applicable to general, app, general population, which is basically uh, equivalent to someone empathizing with other people. So empathy means the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Uh, and then in fact, many of the problems that we have today can be explained as challenges that people have in empathizing with others. So for example, designers not being able to empathize with certain groups of users, uh, experts not being able to understand novices or instructor not being able to understand certain challenges that people have in engineering or STEM education. Um, so in this setting, it's clear that the solution to the challenge is not just a better collaborative tool. We can start to think about how we can design a system that can help better facilitate empathy and understanding. So I wanna show you this picture again. Uh, maybe the fact that we uh, appreciate this uh, dish more because is because the liveness that we had and the, the fact that we saw the entire process help us to empathize with the chef and then how they feel about the uh, food. And this is another example, uh, which I like. Uh, so this dog owner put uh, like a Go GoPro camera on top of dog and then took a video footage while they're, uh, while they're not at home and then like wanted to see what dog was doing during the during that time. And I'm gonna play this video for a short time. Um, and like there are a lot of comments. I read all the comments on the YouTube video. And then some people just make fun of this dog and then, hey, this game is so cool. And then not like really empathize with the dog. Um, and a lot of the reaction was actually that the people said the like, dog is, um, you know, it's sad to watch the dog being alone. And, and we call this sympathy. Like they feel sorry for the dog. They don't feel with the dog. Um, but there were some comments that uh, I think people were, uh, people empathize with the dog. They said the video looks scary, video like, reminds, me, reminds them of a horror movie that they watch. And then I kind of understand that because it, you know, it's, there's no like sound, uh, silence and no sign of return. So maybe that's what dog would have felt. So this liveness that this video provide could facilitate uh, um, sharing perspective and empathy. So from that motivation, I uh, <coughs> named my research lab Echo Lab. Echo represent uh, computer mediated empathy. And to um, and the vision of the lab is uh, creating interactive system or understanding uh, computer mediated communication that enable uh, computer mediated empathy. So a bit, uh, Empathy is not a new thing. Like there is a group uh, called Empathy Computing, and then a lot of uh, technologists or artists or researchers have utilized technology to uh, facilitate empathy or enable empathy. And then these are some of the examples uh, where you can experience how it feels like living in a battlefield called Project Syria, Syria and then how it feels to live in someone else's body, like, you know, they change gender and then they make someone experience how it feels like living in a wheelchair and so forth. 
And one commonality that you see is that every everything is VR or um, everything is VR. So la, uh, uh, and then that's great. And 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 people say VR is an ultimate empathy machine. But it, I, I believe that's more to that. Like so, so the limitation that I see is that uh, a lot of the projects, uh, current projects, are limited to the immersive storytelling, and they so focused on these visual and spatial. Uh, modality so that they kind of overlook this temporal dimension, which is relevant to liveness that we talked about. Um, and the other thing is that target is not really involved, like in, the, in this process, like they don't bring people from the from Syria, they don't bring homeless people in this project. So it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to know whether this actual thing uh, facilitated empathy or not. Um, and then I'll, I'll, apparently, no one knows how to measure emp empathy clearly. So how, what do I do? Like one of the challenge or um, blessing uh, in disguise was that uh, there are no single agreement on what empathy is. Um, and it has been studied in a lot of different disciplines from psychology, uh, anthropology, social science, obviously neuroscience and so forth. And then there are one view to look at empathy. Like the, the one way to look at it is that Hey, we can divide this into affective empathy and cognitive empathy. So affective empathy is like being able to read someone else's emotion by ch checking their uh, facial expression or listening to the voice and then see if they're agitated or not. Uh, and then the other thing is cognitive empathy is the ability to know what another person thinks or believe. And then I believe this is a good way to associate with existing research. Uh, so you can say that affective empathy is relevant to affective computing where people use technology to uh, analyze their face, to understand emotion. And then cognitive empathy is basically, uh, hey, I wanna know what happened so that I can understand better. So let's say your significant other or boyfriend or girlfriend um, uh, were mad uh, and then you have no idea what's, what happened. And unless they tell you what happened, there's no way that you can understand. So these shared context and asynchronous awareness coming from uh, social computing is a great way to in, enhance cognitive empathy. Um, so I do uh, stuff on the right side. Uh, I'm not an expert in the affective computing, unfortunately. Um, uh, but then this felt limited uh, again. So I went uh, further and then do uh, more literature review and then try to understand what people talk about empathy. And then one of the uh, core uh, uh, literature that I looked at was that uh, nursing. So nursing, in nursing literature, empathy is a big thing. So, uh, and then they, uh, um, their, their papers helped me to set this framework. And then the way that they uh, uh, framed empathy is uh, it is two ways. First of all, there's empathizer, like the person who wants to empathize with other people. And there's a target or empathize. Um, I like to use target because it looks like chimpanzee. Um, but people, uh, their, their target, maybe we can support target. And then there's a, maybe there's a duality in this problem. So a lot of the components that you know of regarding empathy is relevant to the empathizer, but maybe we can, like we, maybe we always frame the, the problem of empathy and then give burden to the empathizer, but, but maybe technology could be useful to both groups as well. So for the empathizer, they, they say there are four different components. Uh, first one is perspective sharing. And then the second thing is being non-judgmental about what people, what the target said, what the target happened so that they can feel the same uh, and feel what uh, the other feel. And then obviously recognizing emotion, reading face, reading voice, and those are important. And then last step is communicating back to the target so that they, the target will know what happened and then the empathizer empathize with the target. On the other hand, uh, there's something that we can do on the target. So self-reflection is a great way to empathize with oneself. So, um, and then there's a, a psychology study that those who uh, reflect themselves a lot uh, has better capability to empathize with other people. So supporting self-reflection is going to actually help for both groups. And then the other important part is you have to express uh, your feeling or what happened to if you want to feel uh, empathized by other people. So that's a, a some sometimes overlooked. So um, I like I like the example that I gave you. You have to open up and speak up and then share what happened and how you feel with other people, 
so that others can empathize with you. And again, this is kind of relevant to privacy. And then I realized that privacy has very uh, much uh, conflict with empathy. And then, so that's why we, we need to create this self, uh, safe and judgmental free environment. Uh, and then you can think of it as a social media or online platform where they feel safe and safe to tell and express and open up. And uh, 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 apparently computer mediated empathy is happening uh, within co uh, like computer mediated communication. So understanding computer mediated communication is another component that we have to look at. So basically this is my uh, uh, research agenda. <laughs> So uh, I'm gonna talk about a few projects, uh, which are not published yet. Uh, maybe one of them is published already, but I'm gonna talk about what's going on in my lab. And then these are basically my research agenda. And then I do anything relevant to persuasion sharing, anything relevant to self-reflection. And then there's no single project that does everything, like, you know, that, that does, hey, this is the system that facilitates empathy. Um, I try to, rather, I try to work on these components and then see if this framework is useful to go towards this uh, understanding computer mediated empathy. So yellow ones are the ones that I'm doing, the, the green ones are the ones that I'm planning to do, and then uh, recognizing emotion is not something <laughs> that I do at the moment. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, share some of the project today. Um, uh, in a short time, um, but most of them are relevant to this perspective sharing. So perspective sharing is basically putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And then unless they, you see the same thing, uh, they, will, uh, they will not be able to understand the other people. And then a lot of the, the computer mediated uh, communication system, uh, especially when, when it's emerging, these uh, visual perspective, literally visual perspective is not uh, available to other people. So you cannot really see what other people see. So some of the projects are addressing challenges in literally perspective sharing, like the visuals perspective sharing. So uh, I'm, I named these example based on the, the term called WYSIWYG. I don't know if you're familiar with it. WYSIWYG is basically what you see is what you get, like the uh, old uh, HCI concept coming from the editor, um, because what you see of the editor is what you get on the document. But like these example is relevant to, first example is about what you see, it's not what, what you want, want them to see or what you, what you want to see actually. So, so this is the particular context that I'm interested in working on is like online teaching, obviously by the pandemic, everyone is teaching remotely, but that, that's our fine. There are good things in remote teaching, but there are certain disciplines that are more challenging. For example, um, like physical exercises like yoga, this student uh, has to uh, follow the gesture and then uh, apparently, like immediately they cannot see the instructor. Um, and the second picture, you can see that this, uh, this was a pottery class. And then it's not the, the instructor's face that they want to watch. It's the pottery, the artifact that they want to watch. So, so this instructor showed this pottery uh, to this uh, Zoom call. So left side, you can see how the studio class works. And then right side is some existing solution. You can use Zoom call or there's some like top mount camera that you can utilize uh, in live streaming or online teaching. So we collaborate, we're collaborating with a professor from industrial design to create this new concept of object centric view. So this is not a 360 camera. So this 360 camera is kind of like you are standing in the middle and then you can look around and then uh, see the panoramic picture or video. This is kind of the opposite where every, from everywhere you can see the, the artifact. Like so, so the camera is centered to the artifact and then you can move the camera to see the artifact from various angles. Uh, so it's like a studio class or in, a, in some sense it's better than studio class because you can go back and then rewatch it again. So we create this rig, camera rig that has uh, six cameras on it and then it is going to capture uh, and live stream this online class. And then uh, students will be able to uh, pick a video or angle that they want to. And then we are working on like stitching this video together so that they can seamlessly uh, transition between video. Uh, another project that we're working on is like AR critique using uh, augmented reality to work on the uh, um, artifact. And then this is useful when instructor wants to give feedback to the student. So here's a video of, uh, 
they're, uh, we're using iPhone to scan any kind of physical artifact, and then you can open a Zoom session and then talk about this artifact, and then the instructor or the student can create a ray to talk about or annotate on top of the physical artifact to talk about, uh, give, uh, give feedback on the artifact. So the industrial design uh, uh, instructor can give individual feedback to the, uh, uh, each student. Um, another example, uh, I named it, I cannot point to what I want you to see, which is relevant to what you just saw, but basically in augmented reality, um, barehanded referencing is not working because uh, you wear this uh, HoloLens and then everything is, everything that you see, the, all the virtual objects that you see is overlaid on this screen, which is gonna block the real world, right? Uh, no matter what, where they are. So in ideal case, if I know where everything is, I'll be able to correctly uh, render that. But as you can see, uh, if it was a physical object on the left, you know this person is pointing at four, but uh, in the AR collaborative AR setup, you really don't know what this person is pointing at. Uh, and then honestly, I don't know the answer yet. <laughs> so you can see this challenge of uh, referencing, which is obviously too easy in the real world, but it's not available in emerging technology. So maybe that's fine, but that's not true. Like, you know, it, it may be fine for solitary setup, but it may be a very uh, important problem in a collaborative setup. So let's say like people are doing urban planning together and then like uh, you, you're gonna get scary if this was a heart uh, in AR surgical training. So like pointing or uh, the access is a very important thing. So we did a user study where we asked uh, one person to point at something and the other person to guess what this is. And, and then realize that the accuracy drops by 35%, and then it's slower, and then they're not confident about what their what their answer is. And then people develop this weird gesture to point at uh, these uh, things. So, so imagine this is the cost that you have to uh, uh, have in the collaborative setup, and that's going to slow down communication and collaboration. The last example that I wanted to share is uh, what I see is not in your universe. Uh, so just for the sake of time, I'm gonna quickly move over. So basically what I'm saying is that, hey, I cannot empathize with this person because I have no idea what this person is doing, right? So that's a big problem. Um, There's some existing solution. Uh, you can use like egocentric view, like mirroring screen basically, or you can use green screen. But this is not interactive. This is just like a very passive way to share what people are seeing. Um, another solution is possible this. Um, so let's give everyone uh, a VR devices. So maybe I can be in the same universe that people are in. Um, but the question is, is this the feature that we want? Um, maybe so for this guy, but, but not, not for us because um, VR headset is not inclusive. So there are certain number, Certain populations that like certain people who do not want to wear a VR headset, maybe because the hairstyle, maybe because the makeup, uh, certain people, users from underrepresented group have very thick hair textures, which make them uh, difficult to wear this headset. And then obviously it's not recommended for children to wear headset because it could impact their vision or someone can have nausea. So what do we do? So we create a system that support cross device VR. People can use this tablet device to you uh, uh, see through the VR world using this um, uh, motion track tablet. And we are currently running a study um, to uh, prove that usability and emergency situ and situation awareness is going to be improved compared to uh, mirroring screens option. So I'm not gonna talk about the detail, but I'm gonna show you a demonstration video um, because of the difficulty that we have in IRB, I'm uh, abusing my son to demonstrate the video. So you can see this eight year old kid is using VR to play a simple game, which is kind of like a, uh, popping the balloon by you know, approaching their tablet and to the balloon. And another example here is um, uh, this, um, Jason, my son is uh, actually playing a Pictionary game. So VR has a user is drawing something in 3D space and then Jason needs to guess what, the, what he's drawing. And then you can see that this tablet is kind of like a smartphone camera, but what they're watching is uh, uh, VR world. And then they can look around and explore this VR space and interact with this person. Um, 
So yeah, we are actually uh, creating, uh, working on the spin-off project from this. And then one of them is uh, making this, uh, deploy the system in the informa uh, informal learning setup. Uh, so we are working with a, a local science museum to create a solar system VR where people will be experiencing these uh, STEM science uh, um, content through this window. And then we are using the system to scale workforce training because if you wear a headset, you're kind of isolated and the instructor cannot really interact with this uh, person. So that we are trying to use it for safety training and co for construction workers. Um, I promise you this, this is our last example. So this is an uh, example coming from non-literal perspective sharing, like, you know, what people, like what's your perspective on this particular uh, subject matter sort of thing, not the, the visual perspective. So a particular topic that I, I look at is the, the filter, filter bubble. So filter bubble, if you don't know, it's a phenomenon which, uh, in which a person is exposed to uh, same kind of ideas, same kind of people, same kind of fact and news that uh, that's gonna help uh, make you adhere to, uh, or uh, make you consistent with, um, feel consistent with a particular political view or a social ideology. So let's say if you believe the earth is flat and you watch this video on YouTube, like YouTube is going to keep recommending the video to you because you watch it. So they don't care about the fact, they don't care about whether it's a useful thing for you or not. Like, because their goal is to uh, keep you engaged and make you use the system for a long time. So this is the YouTube uh, uh, front page with, uh, that you get when you do not log in, but you cannot recognize, hopefully, <laughs> maybe you could recognize these lo-fi hip hop radio, but probably this is very different from what you see in your screen and you, your YouTube front page. So our hypothesis that, hey, maybe making someone uh, be on the someone else's filter bubble may help recognize your filter bubble and understand other people better. So we create the system called Other Tube, which is you know the opposite of YouTube. Um, so this is a plugin where it's going to capture your recommended video and then share with other people. So I'm going to share uh, what Other People Other Tube looks like. So again, I'm using my son's <laughs> YouTube recommended video because I didn't want to share mine. Uh, because it's embarrassing, but it's anonymous. And then it, there you can see this toggle uh, plugin. If you toggle, and then you can see this uh, 20 something male who uh, ethnicity Asian uh, who lives in New York, uh, watch this sort of thing. And then hopefully you have never seen this video because it's so different. Uh, let's see another person. Another person is 80 male, white, white male who lives in Texas. And they realize that, hey, I don't know, like, like people in the 80s watch this YouTube sort of video, like silly YouTube video that I, like I do, so that maybe I can feel empathetic to them and then realize there's not too much of difference. Uh, this person is Hispanic male who lives in California. This person is uh, Oregon, uh, Asian male um, in 30s who lives in Oregon. Um, there's one person that I wanted to show, um, female user. I mean, and you can stay anonymous and then you don't have to show all this stuff. And then uh, we are actually, we actually just finished the data and then uh, starting to analyze data uh, so that we can understand better how this could be useful to the research question that we are um, asking. So let me go back. Okay. so. And we thought, we thought it's a very simple thing. Hey, maybe they can recognize uh, their filter bubble by uh, being on a, um, someone else's filter bubble. But we, we all had this much more than that. So like recent question that we're exploring is that how can you help users reflect what they're consuming in social media? And the second question is that how can we help users understand other users in different population? And then maybe this could be useful in discovering new content and then a lot of people talked about, hey, I didn't know there's like a, these sort of classical music videos in YouTube and then they discover content. And then last thing is the most interesting one that we want to like, you know, further explore uh, is that can we fight with the algorithm? Can we disrupt the algorithm? So that their goal is to keep us engaged in this uh, uh, system 
uh, that locks us in the filter bubble, but can we use this? And then by using this plugin, am I going to have more diverse recommended video at the end of the day? So we're planning a longitudinal study. Uh, I'm going to skip this last project for the sake of time. If I can find my mouse. So these are again, my research agenda. Um, last thing that I wanted to share is that you can replace this agent with something else, which is computer. So you can put computer and then use computer to empathize with other people, uh, which we can call computational empathy. Uh, I am not so interested in this uh, because I want other people to understand me, not computer. But more interesting that I, and uh, more exciting thing that I have is that the other way around. Um, can we empathize with computers? Because in the future, we're gonna collaborate with AI, we're gonna collaborate with computer. And then it is probably the challenge that we have with intelligent system is coming, sometimes coming from the, the, the uh, you know, maybe poor intelligent system, but, but also the fact that we do not understand how computer works and how, why I get this sort of thing, which is, very relevant to the, the, the very exciting topic of human AI collaboration and explainability in AI and so forth. So I, I, you can call it computational thinking um, for, for like empathizing with computers could be a way to facilitate computational thinking. So that's all I have. Um, thank you very much for listening. And then this is my lab and then please follow me on Twitter and I'm recruiting PhD student actively. So. Um, and then thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much for sharing all these exciting uh, projects that are happening or have happened already. Um, yeah, I really like this uh, you know, uh, empathy perspective uh, almost as a building block for uh, you know, true sort of collaboration between uh, humans and agents or machines. So yeah, I think it's got a lot of exciting problems to explore in the future. Uh, do people have any questions? We'll have a few minutes for q and I had a question. Yeah, please do. Well, yeah, um, th thank you so much for uh, your talk. It's very um, insightful. Um, I was just curious, um, wh what I've noticed a lot with my uh, research is that it seems like empathy is very burdensome on both the empathizer and the empathizer. So for the empathy, it's the burden of how will like people empathizing with me affect the empathizer? And for the empathizer, it's like knowing what the empathy is doing and what they're feeling is a lot of burden as well. So just curious about, do you have any thoughts on how that type of burden could be decreased? Yeah, like I told you, um, I realized, recently realized that empathy is the opposite of privacy. <laughs> so you have to share the context that you're in and then how you feel, why, you're, why you feel a certain way with other people, because we call it information, right? Information about others. So let's say in a collaborative writing, uh, I could empathize with my uh, co-authors if I could see the entire process, for example, but maybe uh, they, don't want, they don't feel, they don't want to share that process because it, it's not a finished product or something, right? So let's say there, if there are people who wants to work on Word document in a local computer and they share it with, uh, with you, they might be the person who, who are worried about that. The other thing is that empathy is uh, apparently getting a lot of information is useful to empathize with other people, but it always comes with information overload. So if you live someone else's life, and then if, you, if I understand, if I experienced what uh, my wife had gone through for three hours, um, I would understand what happened, but it's gonna take three hours, right? So how do I represent this uh, information in the form that is effective and efficient so that I can quickly get, on, um, get uh, the, the right information that will help me empathize with other people. So representation matters. And uh, it's that representation and kind of the information that you need is going to be different per context so that there's no single solution here. Like you would have to, the way that I approach it is that set the context, set the application and then understand what is associated with empathy. Like, you know, for example, is this a writing? Maybe this uh, history that happened over time 
could be used for maybe is social media and then that's completely different. So I, will, I do not know the answer, like global answer that works. I need to set the context and application and then uh, figure out what's uh, warranting um, empathy. I don't know if you answer your question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it does. It's like I'm summarizing, but depending on the context while providing as much information as possible. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Uh, yes, I, ha I have a question. Um, yeah, like about the, uh, the data you collected maybe in the other tubes. So there are a lot of like personas that you provide, but how, uh, the, it's kind of like relevant question about this. Like, so how did you collect the data and how many data, how many personas did you collect? And then did they approve you to use their, their personas? Yes. So we were very careful about that. What we're collecting is recommended video on available in their front page. It does not necessarily mean the video that they watched. I, maybe people are more open to share uh, what's recommended by YouTube algorithm rather than what they, they watched, right? Like there's like subtle difference there. Um, how many persons we collected? We, uh, I think we collect, we, we, we run this experiment in a batch. So we recruit like 20 people in a batch and then run the experiment. And then we recruit another 20 people and then run the experiment and so forth. Oh. So that we, I think we, so far we collected about 40 people. 40. Um, and then we uh, track their interaction trace within the other two plugins. So we don't track uh, everything. We only track what kind of video that they watched, uh, watched from the other two. Um, apparently there are some people who use um, mobile uh, YouTube on their mobile phone only. Um, and there are some people who do not go to front, front page of YouTube. So it's not, um, we, we, it's not, maybe it's not generalizable, but, but we recruit people who are fine in sharing these sort of video and data. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see a hand. Uh, hi. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm Yunso, and I'm currently uh, like working on controlling the recommender system like YouTube. So I'm really interested in your other chip project. And like, uh, like just for clarification, is it uh, the, uh, is it the screen of others get recommended or is it the others uh, view history? It's the, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, it's the uh, recommended video of, your YouTube. So if you go YouTube, um, I don't know if you can see, but if I toggle this plugin, these are the eight video that you see. These are the video that are recommended to me based on YouTube algorithm. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. are captured. And then mm -hmm. you can go into the plugin and then remove it if you want to. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen anybody removing those video because these are not these are not the video that I watched. It's the, the video that were recommended, which is based on the history of uh, mm -hmm. viewing history of yours. Mm -hmm. So it's relevant to what I watch, but not necessarily what I watched. So yeah. that's, and then that will be shared to other people like, like this in a form. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to set your profile and then some may stay. I mean, it, it is anonymous. Mm -hmm. And then there's no way that you can find, identify who this person is because mm -hmm. what we ask is kind of like a state that they're living in and then age range and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that's what we're collecting. Does mm -hmm. that answer your question? Yeah, so like I was curious whether like then, uh, like each time we get new recommendation, right? Then yes. like each other user will also have the new recommendation. So like it is kind of timely, constraint so like i was curious was oh, there yeah. an observation yeah. about it yeah uh honestly i don't know the detail of the algorithm but basically it's a kind of random thing so you can get different persona but also you can get different set of video from this particular user mm -hmm. and then uh if you go into the plugin you can see the the video that were uh captured like collected from my own uh, and I'll, I'll i'm willing to be 
uh, be embarrassed by sharing what's uh, recommend, uh, to recommended to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but and I I can delete the video if I want to oh. uh, like this. So if I feel embarrassed about like you know sharing this video mm-hmm. uh, with stranger, I could do it. But you know, mm-hmm. it's a stranger that I'm sharing my video. With. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, thank you. Let's chat later. Thank you. Great, uh, we're two minutes past noon. Uh, does anyone else have any question? It's a final call. Okay, then maybe I can ask one you know, like wrap up style question. So it seems okay. initially I, I remember that you were worried about the uh, connection between lightness and empathy. Uh, but I feel like, I mean, there is a good connection in that uh, in empathy seems like a good ingredient that really makes this uh, you know, live uh, interaction possible. Of course, that's not going to be the only uh, you know, uh, thing that's needed for such you know, collaboration and live interactions. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you know, with empathy uh, sort of secured, uh, what do you think is still needed? That's a really good question. So, so, um, so the again, like this challenge that people have, like you know, like liveness and empathy has a similar challenge. Liveness is opening up the creation process to audience. So, you're you're open in public in the the entire process. So you have to kind of, um, um, you know, be ready to perform creative practice in front of others. And the same kind of, uh, again, challenge that happens in empathy as well, like opening up how you feel, what the context that you've been. So, so, so the, the other thing is like, typically people call it context aware computing. So there are a lot of devices that help you. I mean, not help you, like help you in a way because the, those devices are recognize the context that you're in. So like maybe the phone will know that I'm driving so that it's going to give, you, give me a different UI uh, or, or the, the certain sensors will know that I'm dishing, uh, like washing dishes uh, by listening to voice, the sound. That context awareness needs to be conveyed to other people as well. And then we can use those context awareness um, to uh, um, uh, facilitate empathy among people. So right now, context or computing is just one person thing, right? This device know what I'm doing and then it's gonna give me right, right UI or right thing. But that context or awareness could be used, uh, expanded so that I could uh, use those information to let other people uh, understand me better. So that I think that's another important bit that I haven't to- told you in this talk, so. Um, yeah, but <laughs> does that answer your question to some extent? Yeah, yeah, that's very yeah. exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, you've been thinking about this a lot, so I wanted to sort of hear uh, about your vision in all this and those insights. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the great talk and answering all the questions. Uh, so we'll uh, end the session um, today. Thanks everyone for coming, and especially Professor Lee for taking the time to visit Dejan and giving this talk. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you.